So just a little background here. Instead of doing quarks and so on, we have to recognize that electricity in the public um, sense of distribution of it is um, about 120 years old, maybe, maybe 130. And there was electrical devices of one kind or another, props for now maybe 150 odd years before with batteries and so forth. And, and so the whole effect on our society is a very new one. And in many ways, electricity is, is associated with the modern human existence, the modern world we live in. And um, one of the most, uh, if you think about the profound changes, there's two of them that really make a difference. One is illumination. So we no longer had to have rooms with windows in them to be able to do work. Uh, and we could work whatever hours we wished to instead of the hours that were controlled by, say, the ambient uh, lighting outside and so on. Or we had to have arc lamps and pretty dangerous devices. The other thing, and I argued even more so, was this huge transformation from the steam-based plants first to the electric motor. So and this was really, in all fairness, um, uh, and a, a generally, uh, most common after World War II. There were certainly examples before that, but it really became. And this is mainly because uh, old technology persists. So if a factory has a steam engine, this kachuga chuga chuga, and it's causing the rollers to spin, and all the machinery in the plant is, you just pull a lever and it engages the clutch and the thing starts to, to do its thing, whatever type of industry you have, and they were almost every type of industry. Well, to replace all that with electric motors, and run the wires and, and everything, it costs a fortune. And a lot of companies, you know, that the, the complete overhaul of their facility uh, is just simply cost prohibitive. And so they would poke along with these older technologies. And, and now what happened, of course, is after the war was they would build new factories. And when they do that, of course, then you can put in the new toys. And so it wasn't until uh, in, here in Ontario until 1949 that the Ontario government standardized the electrical grid uh, which in many cases used to be 25 cycles per second, 25 hertz, but it was standardized at 60 and at 120 volts. Now, the reason that had to happen was electrical motors are very sensitive to the frequency of electrical power. Now, of course, we can have DC motors and we can have AC motors, and as we'll learn hopefully before we're done, is to transmit electricity over very long distances. Uh, and only real practical way to do it is with alternating current because you can use electric transformers to raise and lower the potential uh, very easily um, and dependably. Whereas with DC, that's a very difficult thing to do. And uh, so as a consequence, um, the idea of a little power station, you know, running the electricity for town X or town Y um, was set aside. And there was a number of these small electrical plants were closed at that time. And, uh, and in favor of much larger centralized electrical power and the establishment of the electrical grid. And uh, that's been, been a, in, with different incarnations, the situation here in Ontario since so more or less 1950, so roughly 70 years. And so the world that we live in and I lived in and mostly, and for the most part, my parents um, has been that world. And in the same way that you folks know nothing of a world without the internet and without that, well, in the case of my, um, my mother, she got electricity uh, in her uh, farmhouse when she was a little girl, and she really doesn't know of a world without it. Uh, and so, you know, that situation, someone born in 1930, uh, and, and you folks born at the turn of the century, it's a very similar type of connection. You don't imagine a world where there isn't this interconnectivity, where to me it's just a new, the new thing. Um, so these are really profound changes, and the idea of taking electricity uh, generated, you know, at Niagara Falls or whatever, and, and it runs a little electric motor in your little facility somewhere through the wires is pretty amazing. And this changed everything about where we could live, where companies could operate, uh, and all the rest of it. So it's a, it's a true um, seismic shift, if you will, to use by buzzwords, but you know, we had the Industrial Revolution, which certainly changed from people power to machine power, but this, this last hundred years, moving from machine power to, uh, to electrical power has, has been an enormous change and really brought on and accelerated by the technology pulse out of World War II. Um, yes, and uh, so that's, um, I guess I've covered all these things basically here. Okay, 
And we've already talked about electrostatics, so we're not going to trouble ourselves with that. But what I want to do now is talk a little bit about the circumstances of where we get charges to move, because that is really what we're all about here. So I'm not going to write the history notes down. Uh, they're certainly not going to be evaluated, but hopefully they're a bit interesting for you. Um, so we use the movement, the net movement of charge. Maybe I should add one more line about we seem to be going and increasingly towards electrical type devices and because the batteries are getting better although they're not there yet but uh, the lithium batteries for now are the f favorite and there's other new technologies that are being talked about so now there's the notion of the electric car the electric car wasn't even remotely practical until very recently because the battery systems were just so poor that your batteries, you would you need a railroad car full of batteries just to keep you going and you'd be too heavy. So the, the advantage of lithium for say the Tesla type car or any of the other ones is that the batteries are very light. They weigh a third of, they weigh a third of uh, what a lead acid battery does and yet they, they are, have basically twice as much energy available plus or minus for the volume. So that's a six times increase. We're getting close to an order of magnitude when you do that and that really matters. And at the same time, lithium batteries charge really fast. So you can plug a lithium battery into a charging stand and compare it to what a lead acid battery would do, you can really charge this puppy up pretty fast. So it's pretty amazing how uh, th this technology comes along. And you know, the, before uh, the lithium came along, we were using alkaline energies, which you know, in some respects is back to Edison, you know, 100 years ago. So, this was incremental progress, and it may well be with the newer technologies, it's even more. But the point here is, is that the electricity is uh, becoming even more pervasive in our society. We're, we're abandoning, at least in part, combustion engines uh, for the use of electricity. Now, in part, that abandonment is because of global warming concerns, not maybe economic ones. If, if the gas was not destroying the environment, maybe it wouldn't try as hard, and that's possible. But given the circumstances, and given other lighter materials and so on, we end up with cars weighing less. And so now, when the car goes down the road, it may, you know, it might only, it might uh, the the person in the car might be half or a third of the payload, which is way more efficient than a typical metal car is. And uh, at the same time, you've got similar performance. So the uh, those factors really make a difference. So we'll have to see um, how it rolls out, but it's going to be interesting. So. Uh, in the case of the idea here, we often use it, so we move charge, um, but again, we're not really moving charge as far as you think, because it's kind of like the Newton's cradle, you know, where you jostle and you jostle this. So, yes, the charge does move, absolutely, but in between, it's running into things and pushing things ahead of it. So, if we get electricity from Niagara Falls, the... Uh, uh, electrons aren't coming from Niagara Falls to here. I mean, you know, they'll travel a few centimeters per second in comparison to much quicker speeds of the actual energy flow. But we'll, we'll get back to that in our AP world. So, um, <clears throat> the uh, charges which move are electrons. As the protons are bound up.
in the crystal. Uh, we use wires, etc., because electrons flow very poorly in the atmosphere. Now, you, um, of course, have seen already uh, some of the stuff I did before and the discovery of the electron, and we have to have these evacuated tubes, so we have a beam of electrons and so on. If we have gas in there, uh, air and so on, the electron runs into all these atoms and it gets scattered. So it doesn't flow very well uh, in air. We all know, just even intrinsically, lightning is so dangerous because by the time the potential actually creates a pathway, the, uh, the potential is millions of volts. And so when you, the pathway finally occurs, there's very little resistance, so you get enormous currents, perhaps a million amps or more. And so the flow through the atmosphere is, is very difficult, and we would not have a system that, that would work properly otherwise, even though Tesla tried really hard. Um, in metals, uh, often, One of the outer electrons has an orbital uh, which includes the entire crystal. And we call such an electron uh, a free electron. Uh, in metals, the difference is uh, the number of uh, free electrons uh, per atom uh, vary. With uh, copper, roughly with one uh, free electron uh, per atom, as being the best one. And we also have to consider how the the material, for example, in Earth, how how much copper or whatever it is is there, and uh, uh, how does it respond? How durable is it? Does it uh, have other mechanical properties that make it difficult? Gold, for example, is a pretty good conductor too, uh, among others. And so these are cases where we have to be careful uh, which one we would say we don't use to wire our homes with. Okay, um, But the other hand is if it isn't sufficiently conductive, then we can get into other concerns, say, where the wires start to heat up. Uh, and this can lead, of course, to fires and other disagreeable circumstances. And so this is a challenge that we have to be careful with. Um, I knew a fellow back in the 70s when aluminum wiring was the new rage because it was cheaper. And the builder of this guy's house um, had put aluminum wiring in and had asked, and I guess he just didn't think about it. And uh, the man whose house was being built, he was fairly wealthy, and he found out about it, he saw it, and he said to me, you know, and so he said, well, no, I, you know, and he said, you rip it all out and you put in copper. And so they had to redo the entire house which I guess had been substantively wired before this was found out. So there was times at that time, not, of course, is when you first bring in a new technology like that, people are nervous about it because you take the wiring in your house after you put the finish on the walls. I mean, to, to change all that is a disaster. You know, uh, that's not uh, something you can easily fix. Now, <clears throat> in a metal, these uh, free electrons are <clears throat> moving around at a, a speed <clears throat> of about 100 kilometers per second 
due to thermal temperatures, to the thermal uh, agitation. Now, if you had an atom, it would be far less, but because electrons have such a low mass, temperature is the roughly the average kinetic energy of the particles. And so if your mass is, you know, one, two thousandths of the other particle, well, clearly then you're going to have to be moving a lot quicker to accommodate. So they're really, they're really moving around. And in effect, they form an electron gas in quotations in the metal. And this is a major contributor to a couple of things. One, why metals are shiny. And B, why metals conduct temperature. Now there's subtleties between materials, of course, I'm not worrying about that. So the reason they're shiny, of course, is the electrons are zipping around in there and they're so much smaller than a photon that uh, the photon comes in contact with the metal, there really is nothing, for, n there's really little chance for it to be absorbed. So it's just reflected off. And if the surface is been smoothed, okay, so it's not irregular, it's not roughened or something like that, then uh, it's fairly easy for it to, to reflect uh, in the way that uh, we're used to. Uh, we use glass and mirrors simply to provide a flat surface so that the aluminum sprayed on the back of the glass is more or less uh, flat and so you get a, a reasonably true view of whoever is standing in the mirror. Okay? And so imagine, so in a wire, a conductor, okay, the electrons are very Uh, spread out and due to electrostatic forces being large and the mass of an electron being small, uh, the acceleration and the, and, the, and, the, and the activity of electrons to fix any irregularities is almost instantaneous. Okay? Uh, electrons will fill gaps and not pile up uh, in a conductor without significant forces, significant electrostatic forces. So if we take a conductor such as this one, and it's got its prerequisite electrons in there, if we want to make a flow, if we want to make a current flow, then the electrons won't come out the other end because they don't flow well in the atmosphere. Okay, So we have to keep them in the metal so they have a chance to flow because the difference between the metal and the air could be a million to a billion times more easy to flow, depending on what's going on. So, so that's, that's not going to happen. And so what we have to do then is create a pathway that is a, a loop so the electrons can circle around and continue uh, their motion, assuming that the energy is there to encourage them to do so. So. Electrons must have Uh, a pathway that is of 
Oh, yes, of course. The rice board got cut off again. Oh, that's because I think I moved the whole game. I know what I'm doing wrong. Just a second. I moved the box forward again because I didn't want it to fall on the floor. How are we doing now? Is that a little better? Okay, very well. Is the left side okay too? Because I can't see from here. Yeah, it's good. Very well. Okay. So the electrons must have a pathway that is of uniform conductivity. And you don't know what that means, but you know what it means to the extent of this discussion here. Okay? So we create loops, or really, let's say we create closed paths. for the electrons. And these are called circuits. So whatever you may learn yet, that's where it comes from. There's a circuit. It is uh, like a racing circuit or anything else. The idea is that the pathway for the charge carriers is closed so they can cycle around and there's no point in there where there's you know an air gap or something unless that's done deliberately for what you're accomplishing in such a circuit there are two basic uh, components the first one would be those which, ah, oh, some red English. So there'll be ones that are going to have devices which add energy and two devices which consume it or um, convert it, say. Okay, we'll, we'll say the word consume. Obviously, we know about the conservation of energy, but the point is within the circuit's context, the energy disappears. So if we have an electric motor, for example, um, the current flows in the motor and it, uh, in the energy that the current had is now converted to rotational motion and we don't see it anymore in the circuit unless we continue to apply it, which is why if you turn the switch off, the motor stops running. And these devices have two basic names. So devices that add energy are known as EMF devices. And EMF stands for electromotive force. And we often give it a script E symbol. EMF can, of course, come from a battery, can come from a generator, it can come from a lot of different ways. So, uh, but a lot of times we just talk about it conjectively uh, that it is, there is a source. And then uh, B, the devices that consume energy are known as loads. The type of circuit that you talk about, series circuit, parallel circuit, so on, is always, almost always based on the orientation of the loads. Okay, so orientation of the loads. Describes the basic circuit. Okay. Now let's go back to my papers just for a second so I don't miss something that matters. Right. So as I said yesterday, a battery is a chemical engine, chemical machine, if you will. And uh, the EMF device maintains up here uh, a constant, we'll use DC first, 
a potential difference. However way it does it, okay? If the positive on one side and the negatives on the other, the boys and the girls are separate and it's doing work to maintain that, okay? Uh, and constantly shooing, you know, it's the vice principal, if you will, pushing the students apart. And uh, this gives you the positive terminal and the negative terminal. And, and as long as it can do that, when the EMF device lets it blow its battery, when that chemical reaction is no longer sufficient to create that potential, we say the battery's dead. And then if the battery is rechargeable, which many are today, then you connect it to a source and the reaction is reversed and because the electrical stuff is doing work on the battery and the chemical reaction can repeat. And so for a lead acid battery, you have three or four or 500 cycles before the battery's got some troubles, whereas lithium, it's three or 4,000. So once again, you have an increase in lifetime as well. So it's pretty amazing stuff. So battery goes a chemical um, machine that can maintain uh, a delta V. However, as I said yesterday, it is electrically neutral. and is a source of energy, not charge. So when you start talking at home about re-energizing your phone or my phone had to be re-energized or whatever and your parents look at you uh, you're at least telling the truth anyway. So, but of course we have slang in our everyday that is, um, that's just part of our human adventure. Just the same as why red uh, water tops are red, hot water and blue ones are cold, even though from a photon standpoint, it's the reverse. So it's just a matter of what we're used to. Okay. So we have the fundamental principle here, which is just a manifestation uh, of laws we already know. So Gustav Kirchhoff was a busy fellow. He had three laws of optics, which we may remember, but he also did some in electricity. And there are two of them. Uh, the first one says, this is Kirchhoff's, I'll Americanize the name, uh, voltage law. And again, it should be potential law, but no one's going to understand what you're talking about. And often abbreviated to KVL. And it simply says the sum of the potentials around, and this is an electrical potential here, not potential energy. So when we're dealing with electricity, the V that we usually use is, becomes a U. All right, so, this, so there's no misunderstanding, okay? So the V's around a closed loop in parenthesis even with connecting paths sum to zero. So any pathway that you can, when we say a loop, we don't mean a circular loop, that's just a language. We mean a circuit, if you will. So any pathway you can find that's continuous through a circuit, comes right at the beginning, if you add up all the potentials of the loads and the EMF devices around, you will get zero. And uh, this is based on the conservation of energy. So if we think about it, and you have a circuit where you have uh, a source putting energy in to the circuit, and on the other side somewhere is an electric motor taking it out and making something spin, then the energy in equals the energy out. 
because it can't go anywhere else and we'll ignore a bit of heat generation and so on. So if you turn off the motor within, a, a, you know, the time it takes for it to spin down, the motor is off as well because otherwise the motor would be getting energy from where, right? And on the other hand, if the uh, EMF device is continually providing a current and there's no energy being removed, then the only thing that can resume, absorb the energy flow is the conductor. And this is what we call a short circuit, where you get enormous currents, and this produces fires. Okay, we'll come back to that. The second principle I've already mentioned is that the sum of currents, I didn't have so yet, so. Uh, in or out of a junction is zero. Now I mentioned here in this paragraph because of the very high electrical static forces and the incredibly small mass of an electron, the acceleration of the electrons in any case of a disadvantaged force is very, very high. Uh, it's probably relativistic in many ways. And so as a consequence, um, if you have a junction, uh, if this is not zero, then either, what's happened now? Okay, well, it seems like we're still working, so that's fine. Um, yeah, I think we're okay. So uh, anyhow, the, probably the email. So the sum of the currents in or out of a junction is zero. So if you think about it, uh, if it was positive, then we have a junction somewhere and we're getting more electrons out than are coming in. That means we have, we're creating a void, all right? It may not be empty, but we're creating fewer electrons there than anywhere else in the circuit. Now, that's not possible because of this restriction here. Uh, and it's a very aggressive restriction. The other one, of course, would be to pile electrons up at a junction. Now we do know from capacitors yesterday that we can assemble electrons, but we have to have some pretty aggressive geometries to do that. And just wires coming to a, to a Kreutz uh, is not enough to, to make that happen, okay? So when we do our circuit analysis and so forth, we always base it on these ideas. And the equations that you know from elementary circuit analysis, say for the resistors of a parallel circuit or whatever, are all based on these concepts. And we'll come back to them. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> so let's first talk about current a little bit. So if we create a situation or a net flow of charge is possible or occurs, let's say. We call this an electric current. The symbol for it is a lowercase i. I know that in some resource in the net you'll see, and this is where um, I get my back up a bit. The, we want to keep the symbols as, as careful as we can. Using lowercase i's are often used because there's a lot of calculus done in this and having capitals generally means uh, something different. So, uh, and you might say to me, well, but sir, this is the square root of negative one. And you're right. Um, but in this case, it's different because uh, we started using currents in the 19, in the 1820s or something, and I think the complex number uh, mathematicians didn't get around to the square root of negative one to around 1900. Anyhow, we got there first by a fair margin. So at least in this business, the square root of negative one is equal to j. So we uh, we we keep pride of place here with our current. If you get on the internet, you're going to see a lot of mess with the symbols. 
Uh, there's a lot of trespass on symbols and mistakes and, and mixing up of units and symbols and it's, it's really a dog's breakfast in most cases. I don't care for that. I want the boards to be as close to what you will see in a university as possible and not have um, crossover all over the place. So you might hear someone, well now to get your volts you got to multiply or your, your, your amps by your ohms. Okay, now, you know, in, in the basis sense, that's true, but of course we're talking about units instead of variables. So potential or voltage, if you will, is equal to current times resistance. And, and I just don't understand why it is so difficult for people to understand, well, you know, distance, the unit of distance is the kilometer. So they understand there's a variable and a unit, but when it gets to electricity, uh, it's, it's a whole new situation and it's amazing how frustrating this is. And of course, the other one that, well, no, of course you get your volts times your amps because you're your watts. That's another favorite one too. And at least for us uh, who are students of this material, we need to get the words right. And so certainly in a paper, I'm gonna be looking for all that kind of stuff and making sure that you, uh, you have your tie right up and you're speaking in the proper parlance. Okay, so if we're ready to accomplish this, um, the unit uh, is the coulomb per second because it's a macroscopic world we're talking about here. I'm not talking about electrons. Okay, it is electrons, but we need a, quite a few of them before it gets interesting. Uh, and this is so common, this becomes a derived unit known as the ampere. Capital A. Uh, this is a French. Uh, Jean-Louis Ampere, if, my, if I'm wrong, I apologize, um, but it's something like that. But uh, there was a lot of work done uh, in those years for DC chemistry with batteries and, and types of things like that uh, back in the mid-1800s and so forth. So uh, same with Volta and you know, in, in Italy and so on. So um, anyhow, the Ampere is used to describe current. Interestingly enough, the device that we use to measure the flow of current is tricky because, you know, this is the theoretical definition, coulombs per second, but how would you possibly be able to count that? I mean, do you, you have some kind of device that can count the little guys as they go by? Ah, this is how many we have. That's not possible. If you add the thermal velocity of the electrons, if you were to go down to an electric, uh, sorry, to the um, zoom in to the size of a circuit inside the conductor where the charge screws are, uh, you'd see a hornet's nest and the they're moving at 100 kilometers per second and the current is moving at centimeters per second you know, 10 to the 5 uh, difference you wouldn't even notice the current so it's quite a different circumstance so we have to use uh, electromagnetic uh, means and we'll come back to this later to how we identify uh, what current is flowing and in effect how we identify the ampere but this is the theoretical explanation which is perfectly adequate so, if we create a circuit single pass circuit it might appear like this So we'll have a battery as our EMF device and uh, we're going to put some type of an electrical device to uh, uh, absorb the energy so we don't uh, just run it around the loop and we're just going to we're going to make it a heater okay we're not going to get in anything fancy this is some type of a heater so here's our basic circuit and so we're going to see um, what we can figure out by this. Now we're going to add um, a couple of other things. So this battery has some potential and that's a fixed value. The, 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 the voltage of the battery is generally controlled by the architecture of the battery. So that's not going to change very much. But we're going to have here a device that measures the flow of current. How it does it right now, we're just going to believe in magic, okay? Um, and this device is known as an ammeter. And 
and you can read the scale on it and it'll tell you how many amps or milliamps or whatever it is of current flow okay so let's just suppose we have this so in such a circuit with a given potential um, we obtain a, get a value for I on the ammeter Uh, based on, or that is dependent upon, let's say it that way, on the heater setting. If you don't like a heater, you could use a light that's got a dimmer switch on it or something. So if you rotate the knob, it gets brighter or dimmer. Like you could do that if you want. Um, so what we find is, is the following, is that um, so we're going to say, okay, so we've got a constant V in my example. And we've got the heater, and we've got whatever current we get. And so what we find is, is that when the heater's on low, medium, and high, oops, we get uh, a lower current, and a medium current, and a high current. There's no surprises here. And what we want to think about here is how easy is it for the electrons to pass through the heater when the heater's at different settings, okay? If the heater is not, um, for a given voltage, if the heater's on low, okay, then uh, is the uh, current, it's low. So it's hard for the current. So in other words, the ability to flow Electron ability to flow, and when the heater is low, there's not as much current, so it's impeded. And less, uh, and then in the medium case, less so. And here it can uh, uh, flow. So whatever the heater's doing, it lets. Um, when the heater is hottest, so to speak, in effect, it's doing the most work. So therefore, there's more current flowing, okay? So what this allows us to do is, in a very simple sense, we can do, of course, far more exhaustive experiments on than this. This is just a thinking experiment. We find uh, we can also um, set the heater uh, to a given setting, a, a constant setting, whatever that's going to be. And then uh, vary the uh, voltage with some device that can do that. So it might not be a battery, might have to have some extra stuff, but we can do it. Uh, and so what happens, okay? And what we find is, as the voltage goes up or down, like so, the current, so as the voltage goes up, for if this thing stays the same, then the current goes up and back and forth. And so we get the same response here. And so we conclude that voltage is proportional to current. And uh, then 
for quality, I will use my constant again, equals ki, arbitrary constant. And now we say, what is the significance of k from a practical standpoint? We've already stared at this a little bit. If k is large, in quotations, then for a given potential, there is less flow of current, right? So if k is large, then for a given v, i is small, and vice versa. So it appears that k is a measure of current flow restriction. We call this resistance. And we use capital R. Now it can be called electrical resistance too, but you know, whatever, right? So hence, V is equal to IR, and this is known for as Ohm's law and honor of Gregor Ohm, Georg Ohm, I think he's Austrian or German, doesn't matter, something like that. And again, all around that mid 1800s time. So we have the current, we have the units here. So resistance then is equal to V over I. And so what's that? Well, that's the joules per coulomb divided by coulombs per second. We get joule seconds over coulomb squared. Let's break this right down into the nuts and bolts. So we'll take it back to the wood here. We got kilogram meters squared over coulombs seconds. Wouldn't we like to say that every day? Okay, give me a resistor that's uh, 4,300 uh, kilogram meter squared coulomb squared over seconds. So instead, we call this in the properly the ohm, which is named, of course, after uh, Georg Ohm, and we use the capital omega. Omegas deserve respect, okay? So we don't do omegas like this, or where, where uh, sort of uh, like so, okay? Omega is a beautiful, round, elegant symbol. So I expect omegas to have some respect when they're done on your assignments, okay? And this is one of the most fundamental relationships in electricity. It'll show up, you'll be doing it. Even in the case of your diode experiment, in real time, you'll still be dealing with uh, a varying resistance, but the relationship is still very much true. So it's pretty remarkable. Okay, we're 10 after. Let's see if I've got anything else to say that would, can be... Okay, let's say a couple of things here, and then we'll shut it down for today. So the basic circuits... And of course, there's, there's a myriad of them, but overwhelmingly they're defined by the orientation of the loads. So, defined And so, we use it typically a single power supply. And if you have a situation like this, the loads are in series. So we call it a series circuit. We can have a situation like this. The loads are oriented in parallel, and so we call it a parallel circuit. And these two types of circuits are very basic, and we have equations that define them, which we'll talk about next day, and whenever that happens. And then we have a combination when we can't make up our minds. 
series parallel. These squiggly lines are resistors. They're devices that have specific resistance by design. Okay, and we can say that here. It's a resistor. A device deliberately made with a specific resistance. So when we have a combination, series parallel. And the last panel for today, circuit analysis. For each component, we have potential, current, resistance, and power. Electrical power, <clears throat> so we have the potential here, okay? And the idea, what is electrical power, all right? So we won't, uh, <clears throat> for the simplicity, we're not going to get an analysis right now, but it is uh, volts and current, but we'll show you why that is the case when we do this formally. So we make a table. With verb across the top. And then the components here. And uh, in a given circuit, problem, some values are missing. Comma, often currents. By analysis, you are to complete the table. Now this is really great. I'm grade 11 and I'm not, you, you can do it, but I'm not going to worry about it. One more panel I like. circuits. Other circuit patterns are in general complex comma network bridges etc and in this case you have two basic choices we have KVL KCL and we have local use of Ohm's law So, if you can do the other stuff, and you get into a single branch of the circuit, and you know some of the parameters, you can infer the other ones from Ohm's Law. Okay? So that's our first uh, beginning of this. We're not done yet, but it's a good start. So thank you very much. I look forward to seeing some of you tomorrow uh, for space science, as well as to do the experiment. Thank you for listening. So last day, I finished up with the types of circuits I said that we have 
and that the basic types of circuits are decided by the um, <clears throat> organization. Uh, so I'll get you guys to turn your microphones off, please. Okay, everyone, make sure your microphones are off. Okay, thanks. Unless you need it, of course. So last time I talked about the idea of the uh, circuit types are basically a function of the uh, organization of the loads. So the basic series circuit, basic parallel circuit are all because the loads and uh, are either in series, one after the other, on the same conductor, or in, uh, in parallel situations. Then we have the series parallel arrangement, and finally, what I like to call a network circuit, where there's no particular pattern and you're, you're right back with uh, Kirchhoff's laws, okay? So we need to go through these and understand what we can. I also talked to you about the basic idea of circuit analysis, where we had the idea of a VERP, where we have potential, current, resistance, and power for each of the circuits, okay? So let's look first at briefly uh, power and electrical circuits. So first we say is okay, so power is defined as the EDT which is equal to DU DT in the case of electricity where we have the energy that way, which could also be equal to Q. <coughs> Uh, dv dt. Well, let's see what we have then. <clears throat> if um, we have a basic circuit, we have v is equal to ir, okay, and um, <clears throat> the resistance. Um, actually, no, just a bit here. One this other way. <sighs> yeah. Okay. So power is equal to q dv dt, <clears throat> but we can rearrange this. We're not going to change the voltage, but we can also, we can write it another way. We can say, um, so let me write this another way. Uh, people is equal to um, Q uh, V quantity. Let's rewrite this. So P is equal to Q, Q V, oh, yeah, come on, DDT of Q V. Okay, there we go. Now, for a given reasonably stable circuit, the potential stays the same. Uh, and so what we're dealing with then is the Q. So we're going to have P is equal to <clears throat> dQ dt times V. And dQ dt, the rate of, is simply just the current. And so we get IV. Uh, in addition, we can also insert the Ohm's law. We can have, uh, so here we have V is equal to IR. So we can insert V into here, and we can then get P is equal to I times IR, which is equal to I squared R. We also could try um, I is equal to V over R, and then you'd have P is equal to uh, V over R times V, which is V squared over R. Now the, the equation that draws the most interest is the I squared R equation because when we look at these situations we might say okay how much energy is lost and it's a due to heat and what have you and this is a function of the current squared. So when we deal with electrical production facilities and other devices where we're trying to optimize uh, keeping the current fairly low is in our best interest because we produce less heat for a given situation. Uh, and so, but you can see here that the energy dissipation is a function of the square of the current. So that can be a real enemy to electrical distribution situations. Now this is just a small thing, but I thought I'd throw it in here. So if we look at, we're going to use Kirchhoff's laws to derive these equations that will help us solve a table like this one. Uh, when you have a circuit, you're going to get a certain number of given components. The things that will be generally unknown will be the current, to usually, and you'll have to figure it out. And uh, generally the power can always be computed later. Once in a while they'll throw one in just to be irritating. Uh, 
So for basic series of circuits and so on, it's not that difficult. But as we get into more complicated circuits, it can be quite, quite a, a challenge to figure out all these components. Now, um, for so a series circuit, so we'll have a EMF device and we have, uh, say, a couple of resistors. Let's pick three for fun. And these are just resistors. They're not really resistors. They're loads of any kind. Uh, I'm just using them as a generic type thing. And so we have a V here. And loads remove energy from the circuit. So the EMF device is adding energy whether it's from the grid or from an electrochemical reaction or whatever, um, and these loads are removing it. Whether they're just producing heat or they're spinning a wheel or turning on a light, doesn't matter what it is. And the energy in equals the energy out is your fundamental constraint in all these cases. And that's just simply C of E, and that's the way it is. Now remember, we divide by Q, so we're dealing with the energy per unit charge at all times here. So we don't have to worry about that. So using V instead of E. Or U if you want to be proper with electricity. Uh, then V in equals V out. We also know from KVL that the sum of the potentials on a loop equals zero. So both of these things make sense. We are going to, energy is not a vector, there's nothing fancy about it, it's like money. So you DECA folks will be able to handle that without ease. So this is your paymaster here, and these are the uh, costs of doing business, and your company is a non-profit organization, it always has the books balanced. So what we would have here then is, in this example, and we'll just use this as R1, R2, and 3, so in this circuit, Uh, we'll just say V battery here. So V sub V plus V1 plus V2 plus V3 is equal to zero. <clears throat> and we'll leave the verb thing up for now. Actually, you know, you guys already know this. And I'm not going to do examples. If you get stuck, we can talk about it when you're in the room. Okay. So. You might say, okay, well, what is the total resistance of N resistors uh, in series? So we could take this circuit and we could draw a black box or a pink box around it like this and you would not know what's inside it. It's magic. All you do is tie a wire to this terminal here, terminal here, and you get some result. And what goes on inside is up to the gods. So you would not, so that would be the version of RT. So what this box does would just be the total resistance of the circuit and that'd be all there would be to it. So what we can say using Kirchhoff's laws, if we come, if we substitute Ohm's law uh, into KVL. We're going to get um, so I through the battery times RT is equal to, oh sorry, plus I. And there's the question. You only have one path. And here's where a misconception can occur. Uh, for some people where we have this conception that the, the loads take away electrons, take away current. They do not. They take away energy. The, and so this is like a shh, just like an escalator or a hose or something. And the hose spins some things, does some work along the way, but the water is always in the hose and never leaves it. So what we're going to say here is the current through the battery 
okay, is a function of the total resistance in this pink box here. So that's why I can write IV equals RT is equal to the potential of the battery. Now, if I take Kirchhoff's current law, which says that the uh, uh, flow current into a junction is zero, I can break this circuit anywhere I want to, right here, for example, and the flow into this junction and the flow out of it must be the same. So by, you can take a limit here if you want to and take an infinite number of them. It shows you that no matter where you are in the series circuit, the current is exactly the same everywhere. Okay, so taking Kirchhoff's laws to prove it, okay, you might be able to intellectually state it, but you need to feel it a little bit too. So anyhow, we have IV, okay, so we're just going to get rid of the B now because we're going to say the current is the same everywhere because we know it is, is equal to plus uh, R1 plus R2 plus R3 equals zero. We know that these are negative, so we're going to actually subtract them, okay, because these are really negative values. They are consuming energy, removing energy from the system. So now we have IRT is equal to IR1 plus IR2 plus IR3. And we just get rid of the I's and you get that RT then is equal to the sum of the RK's over N. And that's of course for a series circuit. We can move to the basic parallel circuit and achieve a similar understanding. And of course, just to back up for 30 seconds here, so now we know the total resistance in the circuit, we know the potential, that would allow us to compute the current. When you have the current, you'll know the energy drop at each one of these resistors. All right, and then the only thing out, that gives you three columns of the table, the only thing left is the power, which is just current times potential, it's very easy to do. Okay, the main concern is, is that these resistors or other loads may have power restrictions that they cannot use more power than, than a certain amount of watts. It could, be, it could be a one watt resistor or something like this. And so what you might want to be doing here is calculating to find out if that resistor is overloaded or not, as an example. If we take the parallel circuit, And so once again, for our electrical analysis, knowing the resistors and knowing the voltage of the battery as givens, uh, the problem of course is generally the current because you don't get to go get a box currents, you know, it's just what happens. And so by able to compute the total resistance, it generally allows us to determine the current through the battery. If we have the current through the battery, then we can work backwards to uh, compute our circuit, as I'll show you in a minute. So a typical parallel circuit here we would have, let's say, once again, we'll take three branches, and this is R1, R2, and R3, and we have some potential here. Now, from Kirchhoff's current law, it seems clear that there's junctions and that the currents in each of these circuits will not be the same, or at least that there's a possibility that it cannot be. For example, we have, a breaking of the current here. There's going to be a current flowing here and a different kind of current here and then it breaks yet again. So the chances of the current remaining the same are just a coincidence. So it seems clear that by inspection uh, I1 not equal to I2 not equal to I3 and not equal to IB so we see that there's distinct currents here. There's no question about it. Now, we can use the current logic here to come up with uh, Kirchhoff's laws. Um, so using KCL, we know, so in this case, we have the current through R1, okay? So I1, and then there's a current here, which would include the current going through two and the current going through three. So I1 plus I2 plus I3 
and all that is coming from the battery okay so there's no other way to say that the current comes to the battery it subdivides into three branches and then recombines and goes back to the battery again so this has to be id so in this case we're adding up currents instead of potentials the other thing that we know is that the potential of each of these loads is the same and it's that of the battery and how do we know that because each of these is directly connected to the battery itself with nothing in between now you have to be a little careful they don't do it too much anymore most circuits are drawn in these kind of standard ways but there's professors uh, who've been known to play games so you could do something like this even i've seen even cases like this where you have a circuit like this one and uh, high school students don't know what to do with it uh, even though it's exactly the same as this except for one less resistor because the power supply isn't in the right place and so once again there's an issue here of memorizing versus understanding uh, of course the other thing that you might see is something like this Uh, this is more often to happen with parallel circuits where they might draw their conductors into strange shapes and maybe have another one over here and connect and so that you have these types of strange shapes that are non-standard shapes and you have to be able to take it apart and see what's connected to what now you might say to me well this is nasty and mean and this person is just, you know terrible perhaps but let's remember something when you're building these things in the lab your circuits never look like this because you're connecting them with wires they look like this so you've actually experienced this you just sometimes forget when you've been given a theoretical problem and this is probably why we do experiments but anyhow just some little asides here so vb equals v1 equals v2 equals v3 this is all connected directly okay and then so substituting Ohm's law in KCL yields so we have um, IV is equal to, um, well, let's remap. So I is equal to V over R, okay? So we're going to write it this way. We'll have V over RT equals V over R1 plus V over R2 plus V over R3. And since the Vs are the same, as we already set up here, the Vs can go. And we get 1 over RT is equal to 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2 plus 3 dots. And this, of course, can be rearranged mathematically uh, to suit you, but that's the principle and that's where it comes from. Okay? And that's the primary equations that we need uh, to solve these. Remember, in the branches here, from here to here is a series circuit. So you know the current from here to here is the same you know that you can use Ohm's law to compute the potential here if you know the current and so on. So you have, although you already know it anyway, but you can find ways to do these things uh, and find the total resistances which sometimes are very useful. We could also put a paint box around this one too. Um, you could have a box like this and all you would have is the current and the voltage and you know you wouldn't know what's going on in there uh, but we could compute it and predict it that way. Now, series parallel requires a little more thinking, and there's a uh, technique more than a rule uh, that I kind of use for these. So let's uh, put something together here. Okay. So there's a series parallel circuit now and you of course can imagine by looking at it, we could create any combination of these things 
you want. There's no real restriction and still confine ourselves to series parallel and not add uh, a network type situation to it. That being said, uh, each one would be different and there'd be quite a number of choices. So how I work this type of circuit is what I like to call breathing. So right now, the circuit is maximized. It's as big as it gets. So what we're going to do is, given what we already know about resistors in series and parallel, we're going to combine all of this down. So once again, we're going to, if you will, put a box around this. And this is going to be a single resistor, virtually. When we do that, we will that'll be like expelling, just getting and we're as small as we can be. We will then, given the value of this, be able to know um, what the current is through our battery. And then we, once again, inhale slowly, and as we do, we reconstruct the circuit as we go, and when we do, we'll be able to fill in the components. So it works out very nicely, and uh, the metaphor is maybe useful to you. So let's do, uh, we've got time here, so let's say, okay, uh, four ohms, six ohms, five ohms, three ohms, and I don't know, seven ohms or something like this. Okay, we'll say we've got 10 volts here. Okay, the question is, what's the total resistance or something like that? So, what we're gonna do here, and I'll move a little quicker with you folks than with the others, is we're gonna say, okay, well, what we're gonna do is we want to ultimately get to a single virtual resistor. So we combine what we can combine. Well, combining a parallel set with a series set, we don't have a theory for that. So that's too much. Combining this one with this pile, we aren't ready for that either. But we can combine these two and produce a single virtual resistor here, which we can then add to this one to get a single virtual resistor in this branch, and then two parallel circuits, and finally this one plus all of this gives us our single resistor, okay? But we'll just kind of mess with this. So first we have R6 parallel seven. This is gonna be equal to one over one sixth plus one seventh. Notice with parallel circuits, you always wanna be careful and recognize that when resistors are in parallel, they will always, the parallel resistance will always be less than the smallest resistor that you're dealing with. Okay, so 3.23. So that's my, this, that's this guy. So then R, uh, that's not seven, I'm sorry, R65. So then R653 is equal to 6.23. And then we have this one parallel with seven. So we're gonna have R6537 uh, is equal to 1 over 1 over 6.23 plus 1 over 7. I screwed it up, didn't I? Because I put a 7 here instead of a 5. So I need to fix that. So 2.72. gives us 5.72 and 5.72 here and now we do another calculation three point one four so we'll three point one five pretty much okay so now this, 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 and this all amount to 3.15 ohms, and we have a 4 ohm resistor, which is in series with all of this. So then we have <clears throat> RT uh, is equal to 4 plus uh, 3.15 equals 7.15. So then IB is equal to 10 divided by, is equal to V divided by I, sorry, RT equal to 10 divided by 7.15, 1.4 say, uh, 
amps. So now we know the current here. So from here, right through, through the forearm resistor to this junction is four, uh, 1.4 amps. So now reconstruct. So this situation, we're right down here to the total resistor, as small as we go, we've let all the air out. Now we're going to pump it back up again. All right. So I resistor 4 equals 1.4 amps. This implies that V of resistor 4 is equal to 1.4 times 4 ohms, which is going to be 6 point. 5.6, sorry, uh, volts. So if this takes 5.6 volts, then the rest of it takes the rest in one way or another. But we have to deal with the parallelities and all the rest of it. So we're going to say that V653 is equal to the remaining amount, is equal to 10 minus. 5.6 equals 4.4 volts. All right, and so we had a virtual resistor here, which we determined to be 2.72. So 2.72 plus this one, this will, the voltage across this combined resistor and this 3 ohm resistor will equal 4.4. Uh, I have a question. Yes, please. Also have to click this resistor seven. Uh, you don't in this case because what voltage is left here is the same across here as is, is across the seventh ohm resistor, okay. and that's why we okay. that's why I'm letting it go for now. And that's you have to remember it's parallel. Okay, one of the challenges with series parallel is recognizing that in effect you've got a virtual battery here of 4.4 volts, and just ignore all this stuff. And being able to sort of get yourself into the smaller parts of the circuit and be okay with that, it takes experience. That's there's all there is to it. Alrighty. So um, we also know. No, we don't. Um, but we do know the resistance. The total resistance of this branch, six five three, is this many ohms here. So what we can do now is we can say, fine, I six five three is equal to V653 divided by R653 is equal to 4.4 divided by uh, 5.72. So that's about uh, 0.669, sorry, uh, amps, okay? Now that's the current that's flowing through the 3 ohm resistor, but that 7.6 or 769 milliamps is divided between these two. Okay, because the current comes in, it divides and recombines, but the current here is the same as the current here. And so we, said, we can say then that I3 is equal to 0 0.769 amps, which implies that V3 is equal to uh, I3, R3, which is equal to, here I'll go to the next line just because I don't want to run out of space, uh, 0 0.769 times 3 ohms. Okay, so we'll type that out. <clears throat> 2.3, say 2.31 volts. So that's the potential difference across here. So the potential difference across this parallel branch then will be 4.4 minus 2.31. So let's uh, work that one. So V65 is equal to 4.4 minus, actually let's be specific, say V653, uh, sorry, yeah, V653 minus V3, which is equal to 4.4 minus 2.31. 
try to get us equal to 1.09 volts. So V6 equals V5 equals 1.09 volts. So uh, I, uh, yep, go ahead. Uh, this should be 2.09 volts. Because I can't add, thank you. All right. So I, um, six is equal to uh, V6 divided by R6. This is gonna be 2.09 divided by six and I5 will equal V6 divided by R5, which is gonna be 2.09 divided by five. And these are just, you can do those. You don't need me for that. And then, the last branch, which is easy now, so V7 is equal to 4.4 volts, as I explained to Jackie a minute ago, so then I7 is simply equal to V7 divided by R7, which is equal to 4.4 divided by 7, and the rest is arithmetic. This gives you the current, potential, and resistance either given or computed for all the components of the circuit. All you have to do is the power, which is just ID. You can do it by spreadsheet. So that's the way we look at series parallel circuits. Uh, teachers or instructors who set exams might be a little twisted and give you the current and take away one of the resistors or something like that, so you have to do a little more thinking. But the logic is exactly the same. Now, I'm going to start, hopefully, I don't know if I'll get there or not, but I want to start what the interesting part of this, which is the algorithm for more complicated circuits, because this is where um, your hair will change color if you don't have some resources. So, uh, a uh, more complicated situation. So without recourse to series parallel or series parallel circuits theory, we have only uh, KVL and KCL plus Ohm's law locally. Now, if you have a situation in a network circuit and you're trying to figure some stuff out and you've got some of the components and there's a section that's parallel, you of course can still use those principles. They haven't gone away. You just have to, it's harder to get there. In a given circuit, in a given network circuit, It is often impossible to even know the directions of the current in different branches. The objective, or let's uh, let's say let's not go that far. Each branch can be assumed to have. its own unique current. <clears throat> Very careful application
of my of this algorithm. will yield a system of equations. One for each current, for each unknown current. Grade 11, which we're visiting for an hour or so, I limit this to three currents, for they do not have matrix algebra resources. They're not permitted the use of the calculators or anything like that. Uh, I have less sympathy for you, and so you could have a circuit with five or six currents perhaps and have to solve a six by six but of course since the calculator does it for you it's more a matter of being a, a careful data entry clerk than being a brilliant mathematician the example i am giving i will give that follows let's say is one from grade 11. Let's say uh, I'm just making it up as we go, so at the grade 11 level. So we'll take a circuit So here's the four corners of it. Let's put in some resistors here. So we'll have um, And another one here, one here, one here, here, one here, another one here, and one here. Okay, no problem, you're still fine. However, uh, just to make it interesting, we're going to add some batteries as well. Okay, and let's connect the circuit now. I've kind of finished creating this uh, situation. Okay, now before I start anything, and if we don't get done, we'll just finish it up next time. So, you might think you know which way the current's flowing, but you don't. You won't know. You know a few basic things, okay? So, from here around to here, there is one current. It may go this way. It may go this way. Yes, there's one battery, but you don't know what else is going on. And it's not as simple as you think. There's another current from here all the way around to here. And whatever it is, in whatever direction it's going, there's one current. And we have a current going from here to here. Whether it goes this way or this way um, makes no difference. Now, what we want to do is we want to set it up so we can create a system of equations. And we have only two basic techniques, and that is KVL and KCL. So that means if we're going to add potentials around these loops and so on, we need to set this up very carefully because one mistake and it's over. So there's a real sense of discipline here to do this with just taking, this is not the time to drink coffee. Okay, it's the time to take a glass of milk and just chill so that you do it deliberately. There is nothing gained by doing it fast because if you make a mistake, it's all over. Everything you've done up to now. Now, I'm going to put the algorithm on this panel and work on the left. 
we're going to assume, let's put some numbers in here. Okay, so we've got numbers for everything now. Um, so the uh, network circuit algorithm Now in my experience is no, no professor is going to show you this You're going to learn it the hard way And I'm going to try and help you s save a little bit of pain here Okay, possibly my A plus in my electronics course uh, when Otherwise I was doing pretty well so everyone likes the first one. <clears throat> We're going to assume uh, a current in each branch. <clears throat> and guess at the directions. <clears throat> like that step because you used pretty hard to get it wrong. <clears throat> now we know from KCL you cannot have three currents, one going this way, one going this way, and one going down. This would create a void here and a pile up of electrons here. Not allowed. So we could design it that way deliberately to show you that this situation will self-correct. That even though you may guess wrong, it doesn't matter. The current that is going in the wrong direction will simply appear as a negative in your solution and you reverse it. So we're going to do that. I'll use some colors here. So we'll say this is I1, um, I2, and I3. And we're going to do the very thing I suggested. We'll have them all going this way deliberately we know one of them at least is wrong, but all three are not. One of them will be at least, one of them will be correct, maybe two. But one must go the other way. Okay. Now, number two. Before I write it in. When we travel, when a current flows through a load, it the electrical energy is lost. So the potential across a load goes from high to low. Okay? So what we're going to do right now, we'll take a yellow, say. We're going to look at each of our loads, assess the direction of the current, and at the direction where it enters, we'll make a plus sign, and then where it leaves, we'll make it a negative sign to indicate which way the potential drops. And you've got to be careful and get it right every time. You cannot change anything here. So decide what these are, and then you've got to be very, very focused on this. And one of the things, again, to remember with people is that current one starts here, not here. It starts here and goes around until there's another junction. Because in between those junctions, there's no other choice for the current to flow. <clears throat> so we're going to have plus, minus, plus, minus. Ignore the batteries for now. Okay. Plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus, and plus, minus. Okay. <clears throat> so, pursuant to the current directions above put a positive <clears throat> uh, when the current enters each load and that current
and a negative when it leaves. Okay, so I've done that here. Now we'll take our batteries, our EMF devices, who by definition maintain a constant potential at their terminals, regardless of what's going on out in the, in the wilderness, whatever the weather is. So their potentials don't change no matter what the current's doing. So free, uh, put the design polarities of the EMF devices on the diagram. Okay, so we'll find another color here. green yet? I don't think so. Okay. So we'll say the bigger plate is always the positive one, plus minus, um, plus minus, plus minus, uh, plus minus, plus minus. You might say, well, I know this. I can just do it in my head. Maybe. How many marks do you want to lose being in a hurry? It takes only a few seconds to do this in your head. I'm taking longer because I'm talking. Okay, so we've got polarities over the batteries and, and EMS device and the loads. The polarities of the loads are directly related to what direction you've chosen the current flow. The polarities of the batteries do not change. Okay. Now we know something about Kirchhoff's laws. We're going to say, well, we need to add the potentials up around a loop of some kind. So we think we're getting closer to being ready to do that. Okay. So let's um, let's look at that one. I'm going to put here in a single line. Choose, comma carefully. KVL, KCL loops and junctions. Okay, so now let's just have a little look at what's going on with this with this circuit. Uh, in our circuit, how many loops are here? Well, you can certainly see one here. And there's another one here, right? But there's also one around the outside. So there's three loops. And we have how many junctions? We have a junction here and a junction here. So two junctions. And three plus two is five equations. However, we have only three currents. So this system is what we call overdetermined. What happens is if we're not careful and we choose the wrong equations, wrong loops, the wrong junctions, we'll end up with a uh, uh, a situation where we have zero equals zero, where the determinant is effectively zero of the matrix. Um, so we have to choose where, in other words, we don't want those equations to be linearly dependent. Now in grade 11, children don't know anything about determinants, so that's not going to help them. So we try this another way, and it's still useful to you even in AP. So to obtain a solution, Three equations must be linearly independent. <clears throat> so 
So the question of the next minute or two will be, well, how do we know that? Or how can we cook the books so we're probably right? Now, as I said to you last spring, if you have two equations in the system of equations and you're looking for linear dependence, it's easy because one equation will be the multiple of the other one and you can see it with your eye. But when you get to three equations and beyond, it's not so easy because that third equation could be two times equation one minus three times equation three. Well, not many people are going to be able to see a pattern like that. And so you're not sure. So <clears throat> sorting this out can be hard. Uh, without determinants, and without trial and error. Now you can choose this yourself. It's five choose three is the number of different choices that you, number of different combinations of the five equations you can have. So it depends on how many times you want to work it. Or you can use, uh, I introduced to you Van Bevel's Law, of geometric independence. And this is always true. If you take your bridge circuit that you built in the uh, lab, the experiment that we did, don't call them labs, please. Um, you have how many currents? You have five currents in there. Okay, each branch and the bridge and so forth. And uh, each branch is two and then the bridge is five. So, um, how do you know? You know, even if you're using the computer to do uh, solve a system of five, how many how many matrices do you want to enter before you give up on this? And now you have how many different loops in that thing? Start thinking about it. You have even more problems. It has two basic principles. One, avoid nested loops. That's the KVL aspect. And two, avoid symmetrical junctions. For KCL. Now in our particular case, if we were to follow this uh, suggestion, we have this loop, this loop and the outside loop. The outside loop, if you will, contains one of these inside loops. That's a nesting to me. These two adjoin each other and they're fine. This one, this outside loop here and this one here are perfectly good choices. The other thing we have, we have two junctions, but these junctions are symmetrical because whatever flows out of this flows back in here again. There's really not, they're really not different concepts. Now let's take, for example, the circuits that you built look like this. I won't bother drawing in the loads just for simplicity. So you have the outside loop, this loop, that loop, this loop, this loop here, that, and this, and one, two, three, four junctions. I think it's like 11 or something horrible. And you have five currents. So now you're looking at 11 choose five, which is a pretty big number. So this junction here and this one here are symmetrical. This one here and this one here are symmetrical. So my suggestion to you is to pick one of the pinks and one of the greens, but not both. With the loops, choose one, two, three. These are not nested, they're distinct loops, and so you're not trying to you're not drawing those nested ones. And that gives you exactly the number you need. You need five equations and five unknowns in this example. So you have three loops and two uh, two junctions, and off you go with a pretty reasonable chance of success. Okay, you have to get kind of unlucky here if this doesn't work. So uh, it's not proven mathematically, but it's a pretty happy business. So in our case, we're going to have loop A here and loop B here, and we'll just take this junction number one. I won't use a number here. Oh, we'll use a let's use a psi. There we go for the junction. 
Okay? Now, oops, well, you already have this written down anyway. So let's finish the algorithm on the same panel here. So we choose our loops and junctions. Now we're going to uh, follow, so five, follow loops and uh, obtain equations. Loops can go in any direction. Well, let's just say in either direction, because there's really only two choices. Uh, six, um, the junction equations, and then seven is simply solve the system. Now let's take this, well, I won't go too far with time, the last time was too much. So let's have a look here, <clears throat> but you know, this is a pretty good story, we're getting close to the climax, we wouldn't want to lose out here. So, so in loop A, <clears throat> what I recommend you do is choose, don't choose a component, choose an arbitrary location on a wire somewhere that has nothing else there. I usually like to choose corners. Then it's completely clear whether the component is in, has been added or not. You can start here, you have nothing in your pocket, and you start collecting components. You go all the way around, doo -doo 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 -doo, and you finish this guy, you get back to the point again. If you start in the middle of a component, you're going to count it twice. And again, we're going to make a mistake. Let's make a really good one. Let's not goof it on something simple. So choose an arbitrary location that is... So adding loops. So your start finish is going to be uh, an arbitrary location on a wire. You can go clockwise or counterclockwise. It does not matter. Okay? All it does is change the signs of all of your, so for example, if you have an equation that has x plus y plus z, metaphorically, you go the other way, it's just minus x minus y minus z. As you know, when a system of equations, you can multiply by a coefficient, it doesn't change anything. Uh, switching the signs. Okay, so let's get a new piece of chalk here. <clears throat> so we're going to start in that upper left corner. And what we're going to do, remember KVL, add potentials. If the potential goes down, it's negative. If the potential goes up, it's positive. Okay, it's pretty simple. How do we know if it goes up or down? We start with a plus and go to a minus, that's called going down. If we start with a minus and go to a plus, that's called going up. All right? So none of this is all that difficult, but you've got to be careful because even one mistake is, you can just hear the wrench hitting the gears in the system. Okay, so now we're adding potentials here, but remember, we want to solve for current. So we're going to use Ohm's law here. Okay? Uh, V3 is really I3 times R3. So we're going to have, and not I3 in this case, but it's I1, pardon me, but nevertheless. So we have equations, so loop A, I'll do it verbosely. We're going to have I1, we'll just use, we'll put the resistor first. So 3 I1, and that's negative, plus 5, so the batteries, there's no multiplication. It's a simple, constant, potential difference, right? So plus 5. Yeah, we drop again here. Minus 4 I1. Now we turn the corner. Don't worry about this other side. Oh, you put these other... No, no. Now you're going to go this way, okay, and around. Now, it doesn't matter which way you're going. The fact that you're opposing I2 is irrelevant. Don't think about it. Okay, all you need to look at is the plus minuses. If you've done the plus minuses correct, this will all work out. So the, the, don't think. It's dangerous. Okay? Now, so and this may sound counterintuitive, and you're going to sit there and go, ah, nah, that can't be right. Okay. 
So we go through this resistor and we actually gain potential. Yeah, that's right, you do? Okay, so this is 6I2 plus 6I2. And then this battery, yes, we gain more potential, plus 3. Then this resistor, yeah, plus 2I2. Okay, then we turn the corner and go left at uh, junction psi. And now we're going to be minus 4 I1 equals 0. So, two primary things to watch. Make sure you know which current it is. So when you turn the corner, this stuff here is I2. And that's where you got to slow down and not be in a hurry. Don't worry if the direction, you, if you went, we, were, we added it up the opposite way. These would all be negatives. And these resistors would be positives. Okay? Doesn't matter. So don't, don't get worried about that kind of stuff. As long as you've done your plus minus is correctly. That's why the plus minus is really matter. Because you'll, you'll, you can't do this on the fly and get it right. You'll screw it up. So putting the plus minus is really worth it. All right, let's, let's clean this up a bit here. So we've got minus 3, minus 4 is minus 7, minus 11 I1. Then we've got plus 6, plus 2 is plus 8 I2, plus 0 I3 is equal to, we have 5 and 3 is negative 8. It's negative 8 because I'm moving it to the other side of the equal sign. I always put in the 0 for the other current just so we know what we're doing here. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. <clears throat> now the other one. We'll start up here at the corner again, and we'll go the other way around just because it's fun. Actually, we'll just go the same way. All right, so we start here and go this way. We're going to get 3I3. And then we hit that battery, and the potential goes up. That's plus 4. Then we turn the corner and go south. It's minus 2I2. Then minus 3, minus 6i2. Okay, then we turn left, come along. We're going to add 2. Notice how I'm not combining anything here. I'm taking it very flat-footed. If you have an equation like you can always go back and see if you missed a component or got the sign wrong. So always do that. It only takes a minute. Plus 7i3. Uh, minus 6, and the last one is plus I3 equals 0. Okay, once again, we'll collect our stuff. So we got 3, 10, 11. So, okay, first we got 0, I1. So let's do our I2s. So we've got negative 2 here, negative 6 there, so negative 8, I2. And then we have, I just forgot, so I'll just do it again. So 3, 10, 11 I3s. And then I have 4, 1, 3, negative 3, so equals plus 3. So this is my first equation here. This is my second one. I've used up all my loops, and we're going to use junction psi. In this case, yeah, they're all leaving, so I see that's negative. So negative I1 minus I2 minus I3 equals 0 is equation 3. And we'll finish up today then with just formally stating this, and I'll leave it in your quality hands to solve the equation. So minus 11 I1 plus 8i2 plus 0i3 equals negative 8. And then we have 0i1 minus 8i3, 2, that's a 2, sorry, plus 11i3 
sigma of 3, and then negative 1 I1 minus, well, negative I1 minus I2 minus I3 equals 0. If we did it as a matrix, you would have negative 11, 8, 0, 0, negative 8, 11, um, negative 1, negative 1, negative 1, times I1, I2, I3 is equal to uh, negative 8, 3, uh, 0. So this is really just A times X equals Y, right? That's what we talked about back a little ways. So you solve it in the same manner. But because you're using my law of uh, geometric independence, you have promising prospects that this will give you a definitive answer. Any current you get that's negative, you just go back to the circuit and change its direction, and you're finished. Okay? So the main concern with this is that you are careful. Uh, and, and don't try to do this on the fly. Doing the potential model is a great memory aid for you. They'll follow your way through this. Now it's a little different sometimes when you've got one power supply and a whole bunch of resistors. Maybe you're, you know, but even then, you can add those loops up whichever way you want to, and the other currents, the way you've assumed they're traveling, you can generally assume. The biggest one you won't know in a bridge circuit is the center bridge, whether it's going left or right. You might think you do, and maybe you're right if it's if it's uh, significantly asymmetric, but you may not always know. All right, everyone, I think that's enough for today. Thank you very much. I will.